what is ARM and why is it important? Well, as you know, that's a, that's a huge question. And a lot of smart people who have spent a lot of time and energy contemplating that question uh, don't agree on the answer. I feel like there are a lot of important fields of endeavor that are trying to find meaning or some sense of order in this world that we live in that can often seem chaotic and random and violent and quite frankly meaningless. Philosophers are trying to find answers, right, to impose a sense of order. Theologians, religious people are trying to find answers to the big questions. Scientists are trying to find answers to the questions um, whose answers might not be immediately apparent. And I think art attempts to do that as well. It, it attempts to look at the world and find or maybe impose some kind of order upon it. Uh, for what purpose? Some art is prescriptive, right? And by which I mean it attempts to be rhetorical. It attempts, it, it attempts to lead its audience to one particular conclusion or another, even if that conclusion is not immediately apparent. Other art is mythic, by which I mean it simply attempts to sort of illustrate how this world works without presuming, presuming to be able to change it. And that serves a vital purpose too. The, the better we can understand something, uh, for good or ill, all the nooks and crannies, not just the bright side of life, but the darkness and the horror and the terror as well, perhaps the better we're able to, to navigate our lives. And even if we can't do that, I think we're just genetically pre-wired to want to know the answers to things, even if that answer is not particularly pleasant. So I think different kinds of art, different types of art forms, different artists walk into their respective endeavors attempting to locate some kind of answer. And out of those artists and philosophers and scribes even, what do you feel are some of the structures that are applicable to this modern life as well as historically that have been a continual theme that give people the ability to have a structure and go, oh, okay, this is how I can move through life with some kind of understanding without completely feeling out of control? I don't know if there's one, but I think the most resonant types of arts are the ones that pose a profound question without necessarily providing the answer, but sort of force you to make a choice. Such as? There, and there, there might not be a right or wrong mm -hmm. choice, but you still have to make a choice, mm. and the choice that you make is going to define who you are. So that gets to the heart of morality and, and ethics, how one sees the world and, and how one decides what moral and ethical foundation is going to inform the decisions that you make, whether it's regard to interpersonal relationships, how you spend your time, what is your understanding of the relationship between the individual and individual freedom and how that individual fits into this thing we call civilization or communities, which by their very definition are built upon a set of rules, right? Isn't that what a civilization is? A bunch of people living together in the same place at the same time, all agreeing, in theory anyway, to submit to the same set of rules, even if that means squashing some part of their own innate desire or primal instinct. And historically, in film, and even now, how, how, how do you see that in film? And what do you feel is the importance the film actually has in almost continuing, continuing this message? Well, I think, I think the brutal and hard answer is that the vast majority of films don't do that. That the vast majority of films serve as a distraction, a welcome distraction. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be snobby about it. Sometimes we need distractions, right? Sometimes we've had a long, hard day and we want to kind of shut down. We want to see, we want to be hypnotized for 90 minutes, 100 minutes, a couple of hours. And we might enjoy that distraction. We might be engaged by it, but it doesn't really work on us in any important or profound way. And then there's a much, much smaller sliver of films 
that genuinely provoke us, that, that, that genuinely make us lean in, that genuinely make us contemplate and think. Uh, and many of those films don't end up being particularly popular because they demand something of the audience. Like most Hollywood-style movies, as fun as they are, and I love them just as much as anybody, but they don't ask anything of us. All they ask of us is to just sit there in the dark and relax. You don't have to do any work. We're going to do all the heavy lifting. But the other type of film I'm talking about forces you to meet it halfway. It, 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 forces, yeah, it forces you to sort of complete the puzzle or maybe that's not the best way to put it, at least ponder the question in a way that's meaningful. As someone, as someone really smart once said, the best movies begin when you leave the theater. But that's a very rare phenomenon. So is that what you meant when you said people don't want to be dis dis surprised? They want to meet their pre-expectations. People just want to go there and just fits their model, fits their belief system and not be challenged in any that, kind of way. That's right. They want their prefabricated expectations, their prefabricated rosy expectations, completely satiated. And what are some of those films, some few that come to mind that do challenge people? If, if someone if someone was looking to maybe even expand beyond, you know, they, maybe they've, they've grown up on sitcoms and, you know, they've never really gone beyond, where would be a good place to start? What kind of, what directors, what films could start opening people up and getting to ask different questions? So just off the top of yeah, my head, yeah. moving chronologically, mm -hmm. uh, I'd start with uh, maybe M, mm -hmm. Fritz Lang's yeah. film M from 1931. Yeah. Uh, Another film is Stanley Kubrick's Clockwork Orange, mm -hmm. Martin Scorsese's Raging Bull. You might notice a, a theme here in that they're all rather dark, kind mm -hmm. of pessimistic films where there's no really aspirational hero that emerges. It's kind of, they're all sort of explorations of that dark side of the human condition. And I think all three of those films, getting back to what I said a few minutes ago, all three of those films are sort of mythic. It's like, here's the world. Here's the world we live in. Here are the dark crevices of the human condition. It's not aspirational. It doesn't have that neat, happy, or at the very least, unambiguous ending. All those films are highly ambiguous, in which you continue to scratch your head and say, what's the meaning here? It's sort of up to each individual to extract the meaning. And I think that's why those, those films continue to to resonate and to stir us. And were those films that you notice when you watch them of your own accord, or was it, you know, a film school or part of a group that you already had like an idea that, oh, watching, because like M, for example, you know, I, I've heard a lot of people talk about it and I was like, oh, let me go and watch it. And then obviously, especially the last scene, I was like blown away. But I don't know if, I, if, I'd, fa if I'd found that on my own, would I have had the same patience and German? Yes. So, so my question is, Obviously, you, you've worked in theater a lot. You've been in a lot of episodic series. You've done a lot of acting, work with people like Woody Allen, and you, you've done a lot of different stuff. Were you exposed to that because of that, or did you stumble across these and you really noticed, oh, wow, this is something different? That's a good question. At the beginning, I stumbled upon it. I was always an odd kid in that I was always poking around in places that none of my friends seemed to be interested in. And I remember reading odd anthologies like the Book of Lists and seeing these famous directors. Here's the list of top 10 films, you know, silly stuff like that. And like the same names kept emerging. The same films kept emerging. And at one point, I'd say relatively early on, I, I said to myself, well, let me see what that's all about. What is this movie M? It's a weird name, M, German film. You know, what's this movie Bicycle Thieves? Keeps coming up on all these... So I started exploring kind of off the beaten path without really probably understanding what I was watching at the time. And it really wasn't until I got to college that I was able to study with some really smart, well-read folks who understood this arena that I found sort of a guide into these films and into this whole world that seemed to me very separate from the kind of movies that me and my friends went to see on a Saturday afternoon. It so, was something different. So it's obviously, you know, like you said, Hollywood is escapism. In your own personal desire, what, 
how would you like to see Hollywood or the modern films change? Do you feel, you know, what, what, what would be a good starting point from the start to weave some things in that would yes. make them not just about making money? Yeah. Well, let, let, me, let me preface my answer by saying I don't have any issue mm. with, you know, Hollywood-style fare. I, I don't have any problem with Marvel movies. I mean, I think I'd like to think there's room for everybody. So I'm not necessarily saying that they have to change. I'm just I'm just wishing there were there were room for more, you know? And what I don't see out there, even in smaller low budget indie films, even in those types of films, what I'm not seeing is what I'll call a certain poetry, a certain kind of cinematic poetry, a willingness to embrace ambiguity, a willingness to embrace kind of a fragmentary approach to filmmaking as a medium something that's a little bit more exploratory, if that makes any sense. And as I said a little while ago, I think that's a tough sell to modern audiences because they have this expectation about what a movie-going experience is or should be. And when you offer up something that's out of step with that, they often become not just resistant but hostile to it. And... Maybe I'm just becoming old because I, I never want to be nostalgic, but I feel like that's becoming that yeah. phenomenon is becoming more and more prevalent. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wrote a whole book about it that was based upon a single question that my sister asked me. I, I tell this story all the time in class when I took my sisters to see David Lynch's Eraserhead, his first film. I don't know if your audience has seen Eraserhead, but we sat in the theater and the lights went down and the movie started. And I'm not exaggerating, within the first 30 seconds, my sister looked at me and said, the whole movie's not going to be like this, is it? And I think she speaks for a lot of audiences in that when presented with something that's entirely outside of the realm of their experience or expectations, they become resistant to it. Now... One shouldn't have to receive a lecture in order to enjoy a film. However, if one understands, for example, surrealism as an artistic movement, where it came from, what it means, and then watched Eraserhead and said, oh, okay, it fits into this tradition. It's not supposed to tell a story conventionally. It's more reflective of a dream, or in Lynch's case, a nightmare. Now, it doesn't make sense. The movie doesn't make sense in the way that a dream doesn't make sense, right? Dreams are illogical, right? They don't make sense. You're in your bedroom, but it's not really your bedroom, and you're talking to your mom, who's also your best friend at the same time, and there's a waterfall there. Dreams don't make sense, right? But no one would say that dreams are devoid of meaning. On the contrary, most people would say that dreams and nightmares are packed with meaning. So that's how you have to approach, for example, a David Lynch film. And I think we human beings sort of need to expand our purview and expose ourselves to, to different quote-unquote languages. I don't mean English versus Chinese versus German necessarily. I mean different artistic languages, different theatrical languages, and yes, different cinematic languages. And we've just not been weaned in that environment. Mm -hmm. we've, been weaned in a, yeah, we've been weaned in an environment that's like, this is what a movie is, and this is how it should be, and here's this book on screenwriting, and here are the three acts, and on page 10, you have to have your you know, inciting incident, and on page 28, you introduce plot point B, and never introduce a character after... I mean, okay, a lot of movies that subscribe to that formula have been incredibly successful, not just from a commercial perspective, but from a critical perspective as well. Yet, there are all sorts of amazing movies that don't pay attention to those kinds of structures, that are genuinely surprising, that, that adhere to, and sometimes even create, their own language, their own cinematic language. And I think we need to be open to that. So again, it's not instead of Guardians of the Galaxy, but in addition to. I'd like to think I can take my sons to see Guardians of the Galaxy with my big tub of popcorn and large soda and Twizzlers and Raisinets and have a grand old time for a couple of hours. And, and then the next night, you know, watch a Michelangelo Antonioni movie where you really got to probe what's happening, happening in there. It's a wildly different experience, but they're both movies. 
we're still sitting over there in the dark watching these shadows dance on a screen. Where do you feel the line is for someone who maybe even listens to this right now, watching this, and they've written a few things or maybe they've done their first film or even they haven't written anything yet, but they're already feeling like, actually, I want to go off piece. I want to do it my own way. Where's the line between mastering the steps, understanding the steps and going completely off piece and just doing it your own way and just fo where do you feel the line is so that something can still have a level of response, I suppose, you know, because imagine if you've written something completely not with all the save the cat and the beats and all that kind of stuff. And as a result, there's hardly anyone that is going to give you any feedback. You know, how do you know something's good? Like, what what is that line between, you know, creating art that you can just feel and you're being this, this is the thing, and it, it, where is that dance? It's a if great... There is, if there is a way. It, it is a dance, but I think, it, I think that's a lifetime pursuit. And I don't know if you're ever going to really, really be able to locate where that line mm -hmm. is, unless you just surrender, and I use that term loosely, but surrender and say... I'm going to write stories or I'm going to make films for the market. This is what seems to be popular and I'm going to do my best to reflect those demands and those prefab structures. No, nothing wrong with that. Again, I'm not judging anyone. Some people approach the industry like that. There are others though that go, that's fine, but I've got this other way of thinking. I've got this other way I want to tell a story or maybe it's a story that that that's 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 not going to be immediately decipherable, but but I believe in it. Well, the only way that you can judge whether or not you're going down the right path is to do it, and you might be hugely rewarded for that risk, or you might fall on your face. So that's the question: Are you willing to take the risk? Right? But even if you play it safe and go commercial, you're taking a risk, right? There are a lot of commercial films that are, that are terrible and are huge flops. And there are a lot of more experimental films that are also terrible and, and, and huge flops. Others seem to punch through that fog, though. So I know this sounds like a huge cliche, but at some point you have to just trust your gut, trust your instincts, follow your heart, Remember that you're always learning, right? You're learning from your failures probably more than your successes, and you just keep going. I was listening to Quentin Tarantino. I mean, like him or not, one of the more successful filmmakers of our time. He tried to make a movie in his mid-20s, and he tells this story, and he says, I was so full of vim and vigor and confidence and we shot it, and then I got to the editing room, and I looked at the footage, and I realized there's nothing here. And it's not worth any, of my more, any more of my time or energy. And he just left it. And he said, that was my film school. He said, I never went to film school. That was my film school. He said, now, a lot of people would just have given up at that point. He said, but not me. I said, okay, what's next? What's the next film? What can I take from that experience and apply it to my next endeavor? So I don't know if you'll ever land at a concrete answer to your question about where that line is. I mean, everyone sort of has to navigate it for themselves, decide how much of a risk am I willing to take? How long am I going to stay at this? Right? Because some people give themselves deadlines. If I'm not making a living, you know, doing this or that by 30, I'm giving up. Whereas some people are willing to live in a, a one bedroom hovel until they die so long as they can get up in the morning and paint every day. So you have to make that decision for yourself. And and one more, I'm sorry, I'm talking no, a lot. No, go for it. I love it. I love it. But you've heard the saying that we're all kind of pretending that we're artists until someone else calls us one. <laughs> so just keep at it. Like Andy Warhol once said, I'm not a huge fan of Warhol, but he said, just keep doing it. And then let other people worry about whether it's good or bad or what they're going to call it or what the reviews are going to be. And while they're deciding, you're off making your next thing. You're off making your next thing, you know? How, how does the world of theater differ to film? 
If anyone's never been involved in theatre, never written anything for theatre, never acted in theatre or film, like what are some of the market differences for you? And what are some of the things you enjoyed about one industry? What are some of the things you enjoyed about one industry, hated in either industry or didn't quite like? Like what, what, what for you was that experience? Well, for the most part, there are a few exceptions, which I can get to if you'd like. But for the most part, if you're going to pursue a career in the theater, you either have to marry rich or have to be tending bar, driving a cab, doing construction work, waiting tables, because there's really not a lot of room for you to make a living. Having said that, Ed Edward Albee, the great playwright, once said, you can't make a living in the theater. He said, you can make a killing in the theater, but you can't make a living at it. And it's very rare that a playwright or a theater artist is able to infiltrate the network that will provide them the, the kind of comfortable living that will allow them to do nothing else. Now, if you're happy having your side gig that keeps the lights on and then making your theater and, you know, small downtown 99 seat houses, which I did for many years, then that's great. But if you want to achieve a kind of commercial success, it's a very, very difficult network uh, to infiltrate. The thing I loved about the theater is the process, the process of being with a group of collaborators for weeks, preparing for the production, the, the, the thrill of a live audience being there um, is absolutely amazing. And there's a respect that the writer gets in the theater that I don't think the writer enjoys in, in film. More in TV, because you obviously see writers who are also the showrunners and the producers who exercise more control. But traditionally, and this might be changing now, I'm not sure, but traditionally the screenwriter isn't treated particularly well because once they accept the check, <laughs> once they deposit that check, it's no longer theirs. And the studio, whoever owns it now, can do whatever the heck they want with it. As a, no, go on. Not so in the theater. As a little boy, you 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 watching the Late 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 Show, and you at that moment you thought, okay, I want to be in the entertainment industry. What was that magic? What was that thing that you felt of like, I want to do this? It started with acting. Mm -hmm. It started with watching actors, and not the actors you might think, because I was. I'm talking about actors that were dead before I was born. And for some reason, I would gravitate toward that old black and white stuff. I don't know why. As I said earlier, my friends weren't into that. But I'm watching Jimmy Stewart in A Wonderful Life or, or Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. And even as a kid, I could say, I'm, just get, I'm getting the chills thinking about it. It's like, what's this guy doing? This is exciting. This is something special. And as I've written about elsewhere, I forget if I was answering another interviewer's question, the other actors that I'm thinking of off the top of my head were Wallace Beery, when I watched him in Treasure Island, a spe specific scene that I still have in my head, it's like indelibly etched into my memory. Spencer Tracy, uh, John Garfield, and that was the moment when I was watching these old movies with these guys, and there was a scene or a moment that I just felt this visceral thrill, this visceral excitement, and I said to myself, I wanna do that. But I was responding to the actors, or at least in part, and then it wasn't until I got older that I realized, oh, this is what a writer does. The writer provided these actors with these words. And a director made these cinematic choices to help, to help build the scene in a way that an audience was going to respond to. But that came later. But that, that was my first spark, was watching these great old actors. And that was, so that was, as you got older, you kind of realized and learned, oh, actually, I enjoy this process more than actual stuff I was responding to. That's yeah. the thing that makes me feel alive. Yeah, especially when I started encountering the types of films that uh, you were asking about when, when you started this interview, the, 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 the stranger films, the ones that kind of demanded something of us. Then I started thinking about, you know, movies as a storytelling mechanism how you could piece together these bits of temporal footage in ways that have this kind of cumulative effect. And what, and what was the moment that, that inspired you to move into being a professor, teaching, and what, what was, was there a particular moment or what, what kind of- It was a particular that? experience. Because if you had told me, I mean, when I was an undergraduate in college, 
if you had told me that I was going to go get a master's degree, a PhD, and be a college professor, I would have laughed in your face. Even that late, even as an undergrad in college, that wasn't on my radar. It wasn't until several years later, after I'd been in New York for years and I was producing theater and writing plays and directing plays and getting some acting gigs, that I ended up applying for a playwriting fellowship. At some point along the line, I'm not even sure when, I felt like I was making more progress and gaining more traction as a writer than as an actor, as a director. So I applied for this playwriting fellowship to study with a guy named Derek Walcott. I don't know if you know who that is, but he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, in 92. This was long before I studied with him. And he was the artistic director of the Boston Playwrights Theater, which was operated under the auspices, both financial and administrative auspices, of the English department at BU. So I was basically applying to grad school. And it was very exclusive. They only accepted six writers. And lo and behold, I, I got in. So now I found myself in a master's program. I just went to take writing workshops with Derek, but there I was in a, a master's program. And oddly enough, the writing workshops, as, as fascinating as they were, turned out to be the least exciting thing of my tenure there. And the most exciting and fruitful thing were the critical analysis classes and the literature classes and the history classes. And it was at that time that I was also awarded a teaching fellowship to help pay my tuition. So that's when I started teaching at the college level. So that got me thinking. I love all this kind of academic scholarly stuff. And not just something separate. I felt like that was feeding my creativity more than the writing workshops. And at the same time, I was teaching and loving it. So I thought, maybe, maybe this is a pursuit. That's what got me thinking about a PhD program and, and teaching. And I never stopped teaching after that. Like even when I was in my doctoral program, I was always teaching and have never stopped. And I always thought that no matter what kind of commercial success I might achieve, I'd always want one foot in academia. I'd always want to post somewhere, you know, even if it was teaching one class somewhere for one semester a year. I always wanted that kind of academic home. And that's kind of how it's worked out. And now with all the different classes you teach, you teach history of film, screenwriting? Film appreciation. Film appreciation. Weird way of putting it, but almost like, what is it you feel more than anything students need as they're entering into this industry? Like, what is the wake-up call or the clip behind the ears? Like, what is it they need to, like, get them set up as best as possible to actually have the attitude and the skill set and everything to actually get somewhere that they want to get in this industry? Well, there are two things. The first is more sort of internal, and that is, as I said before, you got to widen your purview. you got to experience everything. You need to go to art museums. You need to look at abstract art. You need to look at, you know, Dada and, and surrealism and futurism. You got to understand classical art and architecture and Renaissance and the Baroque. You got to explore other cultures. What is what is 18th century Chinese lute music sound like and why? You got to watch movies, old films, black and white films, foreign films. Uh, films that might not be in alignment with what, you know, you're used to. Try different foods, you know. Don't be one of those, well, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. That, that drives me nuts. It's like, I know what I like. I know what I like. To which I always want to respond, is that all you know? Is that all you know? What you like? What else do you know? So experience things. Widen your purview. And I think that's going to give you access to a lot of wonderful things that this world has to offer. That's not only going to feed your own imagination and creative pursuits and intellectual pursuits. It's also just going to enrich your life. It's going to enrich your life. That's one. Two, especially in 2023, get it done yourself. What do you have access to? If you can't afford to access Dodger Stadium or don't know the groundskeeper, then set your scene at the park down the street. You do have access to that. Hey, Grandma, can I, can I shoot in your basement? Does your uncle have an old warehouse downtown? What can you access? Back your story into that. Use your 5D camera, your two LEDs, 
Now, you need a good script, right? You need access to good actors. But they're everywhere. This is L.A. You can <laughs> you throw, a, throw a stick down Sunset Boulevard, you'll hit 10 of them. who are dying for work. Now, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats. So make sure you're fluent in all the software. Understand that you as a writer and director might also have to operate the camera. You might also have to be the guy running around setting up your lights. You might be the person in charge of post-production on your laptop. But you can get it done. So if you got a strong script, you have access to good actors, and you're fluent in cinematic techniques, you probably have the, the tools that you need. You know, the guy that made Tangerine, which was a big hit at Sundance, he, he shot it on his cell phone. And watch it. It looks fantastic. It's perfectly appropriate to the story that he's telling. And he's not trying to compete with the Avengers. He's making this small, intimate story that's, that's perfectly appropriate to the means that he has available to him. And that's, that's the other thing you need. Start thinking like a producer. What can I get done myself? Now, there are a whole other set of challenges. Like, once it's done, then what do you do? Right? You just throw it on YouTube and hope it catches fire, you and 50,000 other people? Maybe. You try to bust into a prestigious film festival? Maybe. That's hard, though, right? Sundance receives 10, 15, 20,000 submissions every year. Like, how do you... But the, the landscape is changing, and this generation can be a part of that change. So it's kind of an exciting time to be a, a part of this industry because it's in flux, and I don't think anyone quite knows where we're going to land. But as far as creating the content, you can get it done, just like you're doing right now as I'm speaking. You're getting, you're making content right now with the tools that you have available to you. In your own journey, anything you look back on and go, ah, if only I'd known what I know now, I would have done this different. How long is this? podcast <laughs> oh yeah it, it, it drives me crazy when people say I have no regrets because like, you have no regrets you did everything perfect well I certainly have not done it, everything perfectly now I don't blame myself because at the time when I made the choice it seemed like the right thing to do but if I knew now what I knew then no I would have made different choices and in all kinds of aspects of my life, personal and professional. I'm not depressed about it. I'm not beating myself up about it. But isn't that called, like, learning? Like, okay, you made a mistake. Oh, now I know better for next time. I may have gone to law school instead of gotten a degree in drama or creative writing. I feel like there are a lot of lawyers who were better positioned to establish themselves in the entertainment industry as producers and creative people than people who sort of, you know, went into to, to art programs. So, yeah, there, there are lots of things I would do differently. And if you could go back and tell the 18-year-old self a piece of advice to like, see you through to try and make different decisions, what might that be? For anyone maybe listening to this, watching this, something that they could really hold on to as like a bit of a guide, what would that be? I say you have to be honest with yourself when you ask the question, what kind of life do I want to live? Do I care about lots of money or fame and fortune? Is the reason I'm doing this to have a mansion in Bel Air and the, and the, and the Maserati in the driveway? That's fine. I mean, that's fine. There are much more efficient routes to attain that, though, right? So once you've decided, what do I want my life to resemble? Then you might, and you have to be honest about that. Then you might be better positioned to to choose your track earlier on, because a lot of what you can learn in an art school or a drama program or a filmmaking program, much of it, not all of it. Sometimes you need a guide. Sometimes you need access to resources, but much of it you can learn outside of school. And if you want the security, the sort of comfort. And then maybe establish yourself in a more sort of traditional career that might not be directly involved in your in your in your in your passion, but peripherally. Like I just said, you could 
as an entertainment lawyer, for example, you might find yourself better positioned to become a movie producer than tending bar and trying to scrape together stuff. So, again, every, everyone's going to have their own answer to that question. But it has to do with what, what am I willing to sacrifice? You know, how, how, much, how, how much sweat equity am I willing to put into this knowing that nothing might ever materialize? There are brilliant people out there. I'm sure you know them. Creative people, hardworking people. They're wonderful writers. They're wonderful actors. They're wonderful directors who can't even get an agent, much less get a film made, much less, you know, get on a TV show. Uh, that's, just the, that's just the way of the world. That's the nature of this business. It's ferociously competitive, and you have to understand that. And it doesn't always reward merit. It doesn't always reward hard work. Sometimes it does. But too often we rely on the cliche that if you work hard and if you believe in yourself, you're going to make it. There's no guarantee whatsoever. You can work harder than anybody. You can be loaded with talent. You can believe in yourself more than anyone's ever believed in themselves before and still might not, quote unquote, make it, whatever that means. Are you willing, are you willing to dive into that understanding? I can't answer that question for you. I've heard you say before, and I've heard quite a few people say this, actually, that you need to have other areas of your life, you know, not just intact, but fruitful, you know, if you're going to pursue this, because if you've got all your eggs in one basket, you know, people get crushed. For you now, with every, all the experience you've got, what for you now is the kind of driving passion? What is the call? What is the pull? Maybe the next phase that you're going into now? The next phase, and when I talk about what's important right now, most of it doesn't have much to do with a career mm -hmm. anymore. It has to do with my family and my home and my, my two young sons and going fishing with them or cooking out with them by the pool. That's what, you know, excites me. But, you know, as Sigmund Freud said, I think human beings also have this uh, a sort of passion for some kind of work. And that's there, too. But as I get older, I'm starting to drift toward things that is going to sound awful, but I'm being honest with you, that are less collaborative, that I can get done all by myself. I can go to my studio at home and paint, and I can finish a painting without needing anyone else's input, without needing anyone else's money. All the money I need is to pay for the pigments and the brushes and the knives. Or when I write writing novels or, or academic books that I can complete on my own. That doesn't mean they're going to be any good. doesn't mean I'll necessarily get them published. But I can get them finished without having to collaborate with anybody else. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. And that, that type of existence is becoming more and more attractive to me. Yeah, makes sense. And you can paint as well, to be fair. And who do the validation, but yeah, you can paint. Thank so you. for anyone listening right now, anyone watching this, if you were to leave with some parting words of inspiration or encouragement, what what would that be? For any for any student or even someone who's been in the industry for a while and maybe is feeling beleaguered in some kind of way or you know, maybe just to guide them into what matters, what would that be? I'm gonna give you the same pieces of advice that I give every single time. So if you look up at older interviews, you're mm -hmm. going to find the same thing. And all of them kind of harken back to things that I've said during this interview. One, I'm quoting Arthur Ashe. Where do you begin? You begin where you are. What do you use? You use what you have. Okay? Or what do I do? You do what you can. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. The other was the kind of Warhol quote that I already threw at you. Keep going. <laughs> or let other people worry about whether it's good or bad. Just keep go on making the next thing. And finally, one of my favorites, which I'm, I, I hate that it's one of my favorites because this was not a particularly good person, but I love this quote, and it's from Thomas Edison, who once said, most people miss opportunity because it wears overalls and looks like hard work. 
And that's the main piece of advice. Roll up your sleeves, put your nose to the grindstone, do what you can given the resources that are available to you, and get to work day in and day out, every single day. Devote X amount of time and energy to it, no matter what else is going on. Even when you're not inspired, especially when you're not inspired. That's the advice. I can't predict, I'm not saying that's a path to success necessarily. But without that, um, I think you're in trouble.